both barrels of grace, and you can say that. Um, Romans 3.28, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. So we are justified, that is declared righteous before God by faith. In other words, that we trust in God's promises and that God forgives our sins for Jesus' sake. That's kind of the that's the core of what it means to be a Christian. Because that has to do with who Jesus is and what Jesus does. And I, I don't know if you could say that there was a theme verse of the Reformation. Uh, if there was, this would certainly be one of, the, one of the verses that would be in contention for that. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Let's pray. Blessed Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the many mercies that you have showered upon us, your people. We especially thank you for the Reformation, for keeping the true gospel before us, and for the forgiveness of sins won by Christ's death and resurrection. We pray that you would bless us now as we continue to study your grace and all of the gifts that we receive from you. Your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Okay, now, 
You can imagine everyone setting their hair on fire over this mm -hmm. and, and all, all sorts of things going on. It is important to kind of parse out the words a little bit because um, but just to understand, first of all, what he said and what he didn't say. Because um, popes are great parsers of words. <laughs> and, and it was quite, quite carefully stated. First of all, um, he did not put it in a what's called a papal encyclical or as a, as a public statement of the doctrine of the church. So uh, even no matter what he said, in, in kind of that context, this would be his uh, pious opinion. Now, his pious opinion would hold, oh, so much more weight than, than any of ours. <laughs> but it nevertheless would not kind of automatically establish church teaching in that way. So that's kind of, kind of number one. Um, number two, most people don't know that. And so most people sort of assume anything the Pope says is automatically infallible and is the church's public teaching. If you're, um, that, that I'm quite confident is what most Roman Catholics believe or some variation of that. And so if the Pope says something, even in a casual way, um, it, it kind of takes on a life of its own very, very quickly. Um, but nevertheless, what he said was is that he was in favor of civil unions, and that and and that everyone deserves to have a family. Um, what he didn't say was that he was changing the Roman Catholic Church's public teaching on homosexuality or same-sex marriage or any of these things. He didn't say that, and he almost certainly will not say that because that would that would really raise kind of some amazing things. But by saying this, what he has what he has sort of done is kind of created a scenario where uh, where well-intentioned pious Roman Catholics can kind of believe whatever they want now and feel like they have cover from the Pope. And, that, and again, I'm not talking about what is true or false here. I'm just kind of talking about this sort of how things tend to play out in the Roman Catholic Church, and this is why it is so um, messy. And this is, to a lesser extent, a lot lesser extent, I think that we can understand that. Because, you know, I, as a pastor, if I say that I, be I believe that the moon landing was, was faked, um, the assumption is going to be that Holy Cross Lutheran Church is now taking a public stance against the moon landing, <laughs> which would be a poor choice, let's say. <laughs> but because I say it as a pastor, I have to guard my words and, and not say things even in a casual way that can be misconstrued as a part of the teaching of the church. And so for me to say something that kind of opens a door for people to intentionally misinterpret it um, is what I would call deception. Does that make sense? And so what we're now going to see, <laughs> and it's just going to be a big mess, is we're now going to see this big fight in the Roman Catholic Church over the kind of traditionalist and the, the more socially liberal contingency of which the Pope is part. And they're going to kind of fight over this but there really isn't actually anything for them to fight over because he didn't make a, an official saying. This is just kind of drawing out, drawing out people that don't like you so that they get angry and, and say things that are going to get them in trouble. You know, which sounds a lot like American politics, frankly. And that's a pretty fair analogy, Mary. So my family is all and. I had a long conversation with my first cousin last night over this, and the way a lot of the Catholics are looking at this is how can you preach the Bible and say that? And that's what a lot of Catholics are questioning. Right. How, and then, how do you make those two things? And, and here's, a, and, and I'm, I'm so glad that you bring this up, Mary, because this is such an important thing as we are just about to talk about 
the doctrine of grace and how grace played out in the Reformation. And, and obviously, that's a very important question. The question of same-sex marriages, as important as it is, and I believe it is, is not nearly as important as the question of are you saved by grace or by works. That's a much bigger question. That's a much more important question. And, and so oftentimes what happens is we can kind of get fired up over, over things that kind of make us forget what the real bottom line point is. The bottom line point is, is Jesus sinners does receive <laughs> and, and the grace of God that's given to us in Christ. That's the point. That's always the point. That's finally the point. And so I believe that our challenge and that your, your relative's challenge is always going to be how do we how do we talk about these things faithfully, intelligently, and offer and offer pastoral care and show grace to everyone, um, while kind of continually getting back to what the real important thing is, which is what's the gospel? That's that's always the the issue when we talk about these things. Pastor Mike, Paul. or was there a hand over here? Paul, yeah. oh, and then Pastor. Mike. I'm confused, so I'd like to ask a question and then have a follow-up question. All right. Do you use the term civil union and do you use the term same-sex marriage? Which are we talking about? Well, of, of course, the term that the Pope used, okay, this is this, these aren't my terms. The term that the Pope used in this documentary was civil union. Wait, can I ask my follow-up on that? Sure. I come from a place like Texas where they have what's called common law marriage. Sure. Okay, common law marriage is when a man and a woman are cohabitating for extra right. time. The law recognizes that as a marriage. That's right. Some so kind of, it has some sort of legal recognition. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so if the Pope says civil union, are you reading more into it when you say same-sex marriage? Because he didn't say same-sex marriage according to what you're telling me. And, and, you, have, and you have hit precisely on why I said that popes are experts at nuancing words, and that and and this is a this is a very important kind of thing is is that no they aren't the same thing, but they also kind of sort of are the same thing because it is uh, what I would call um, semantic games to uh, to to use a term that that really fully intends to mean marriage. There is, there is zero question, in my mind at least, that the intention and desire of those who supported same-sex uh, civil unions, that the intention is, is that that would, that would move toward uh, changing the legal definition of marriage. I, I, that's my opinion, but I, I don't think there's any real Kind of substantial argument to the other, to the contrary. So when we talk about these things, we have to be very careful about our language and sort of what we're what we're talking about and recognize what did he say and not say. And that's why I said he said nothing about um, endorsing homosexuality or about same-sex marriage. That's not in there. <laughs> what he said was everyone deserves a family and that he's in favor of civil unions, which is kind of more of a legal thing. Um, what the larger implications behind that are is, is very big. And maybe we, can, maybe we can talk about that further, but that's, but that's exactly why it's so tricky to think about. Robert, Robert, um, Robert. My, my question is, um, if I think of civil union as something that you can You know, that's a, that's a great question. It's probably beyond my knowledge. Um, and, and I would say, in general, how, how the Roman Catholic Church has addressed questions like this varies wildly from 
diocese to diocese or archdiocese to archdiocese. And so if you have a, a liberal um, archbishop or bishop, he's, gonna, he's going to simply not pay any attention and is not going to look. But if you have a more conservative one, he might, he might be much more specific on that. But neither is going to publicly speak against the public teaching of the church. And so it's, as I said, it's very, very, very messy. And that is just the teeny tiny tip of that iceberg. I'm sorry, and then Jill. I'm just different from what the LCA did about 10 years ago. Um, well, the ELCA, it's, it's a little different in that the ELCA has publicly uh, spoken in favor of not simply civil unions, but of same-sex marriage and, in fact, of, of homosexuality as an acceptable biblical lifestyle. So that is, a, that is quite a bit farther, quite a bit different. Bill? Uh, you know the saying, perception is reality, reality is perception? Yep. Right. Well, and that's why I say. Is that, is that a life to it all? Yeah, absolutely. And that this is just one example of a you know bazillion. This happens all the time in the media. Is that the media takes takes one little kind of word or thing and decides this is going to fit what we want to push as as reality. This fits our agenda, and then we're going to use this in favor of our agenda. And that's kind of a, a, a difficult thing. I have a, a just kind of another another weird example of the same thing. So I have a, a, a friend who is a pastor in um, Woodland, which is in Yolo County. In Yolo County, they have somebody that that is a, a really really hates churches, and every single week calls and complains that these churches are violating all of the state mandates regarding masks and social distancing and stuff. So that every single church in Woodland uh, has somebody come almost every single week and observe them during their services. And so, and so they have a little network of, this is Dave Martin for those of you, but they have a little network of all of the churches Kind of keeping track of what do they what do they do so that they can so that they can be saying the same thing. But that's a perfect example of something where I have no idea what the intention of that person is other than just being mean and causing trouble. But somebody gets a hold of that and they're going to use it for something that's not good. That's that's the bottom line. So to wrap this up, and I and I really am happy to kind of go back and continue this discussion, or better still, maybe you should ask Pastor Meyer or Pastor Froch. But I want to get, I want to finish up with, uh, finish up with Grace here. <laughs> Literally, I want to finish with, I want to uh, make sure that we get to our Grace discussion. So, we, um, uh, so the last couple weeks, three weeks, I think, we've looked at Grace in uh, the Old Testament, we looked at those, those two Hebrew words. We looked at grace in the New Testament, particularly looking last week at Paul um, in, in Romans, but elsewhere. Um, what I want to do to kind of wrap up this discussion is talk for just a minute about how grace and the kind of what we understand grace is and how central that was in the Reformation. Okay, so that's kind of what we're going to do. And I have at the top there two, these two definitions of grace. Gratia infusa, or infused grace, as a quality in human beings given to them by God. Grace is kind of a thing that you can receive a substance. And gratuitus favor dei, gracious favor of God, means that this is God's disposition or attitude toward us in Christ. So either grace is how God looks at you, his disposition, his attitude toward you, or grace is a thing that you receive. Now, grace can be both of these. This is not 
one's right and one's wrong. That would be way too easy. But it can be, it can be both. So we, if you remember back from last week, sometimes you can say that you have been graced with this gift of the Spirit. We get Paul will talk about how uh, sometimes grace means the gift that you receive because of God's favor disposition for you or how God looks at you. So we, you know, so we might receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit, hope, love, patience, joy, etc. And that that can be a gift that we receive. But, and most importantly, when we're talking about salvation and eternal life and how I, how I become and stay a Christian, what grace means in the scriptures is this is how God looks at me. Okay? That's, that, that is at the very simplest way and clearest way. This is how God looks at me. God, and because God looks at me with grace, God also graces me with gifts. <laughs> so he might give me the fruits of the Spirit, peace, job, love, joy, hope, etc. But it is because of God's attitude, disposition, way of looking at me that everything else happens. Does that make sense? Okay? So, when you get to the time of the Reformation, 16th century, uh, grace, for the most part, meant much more the quality or thing that you have in you that you've been given by God, rather than God's attitude toward you. Okay? And so, the church even would start talking about having a treasury of grace. That you have this treasury that, that God has given the church this treasury of grace for the church to disperse, that the church is the one that disperses the sacramental, kind of the sacraments and the sacramental life. And so you have this, so you have this picture, and you can sometimes literally have a picture, a woodcut, <laughs> of of a treasure trove of grace in heaven that the church is is kind of giving out. Okay? And it takes, it, it does not take very much to, to think and to kind of recognize, all right, so how do I get these, how do I get this treasure? How do I get these things? Well, from the sacraments. And there are lots of lots of ways of doing that, just as there are lots of sacraments. But you even had, and this is kind of where uh, where this grace thing started to kind of come home. You even had this idea of indulgences that uh, that instead of thinking of grace as this, this is the gift that the church gives out, this becomes the storehouse that the, that the church. It becomes a resource that the church uses for its own purposes. So, so the um, so kind of the big thing that was the impetus behind Martin Luther's 95 Theses was uh, the rise of what are called indulgences. How many of you have heard of indulgences before? Okay, most of you have at least heard of indulgences before. Um, and in, an indulgence is a um, is a document that is written that is approved ultimately by the Pope, but it can be kind of authorized by an archbishop, um, saying that such and such person uh, has received an indulgence, you know, which to indulge to you know, so you, it, it's, it almost actually has kind of gift sort of language to it. Um, an indulgence for um, a certain amount of time of purgatory, or even a what's called a full or plenary indulgence, so that you can, uh, it's kind of a get out of hell free card. <laughs> Like this is some 
thing that had been going on for a thousand years. This was a relatively recent innovation in the church that had taken place. And, and Luther starts to look at these indulgences and say, this is, this is turning God into um, something else that God now is not the gracious one, the one that gives us grace, that loves us, that has this disposition or attitude toward me, but rather, um, I don't really have anything to do with God at all. Now I've got to deal with the church. So instead of actually hearing what God thinks of me, it becomes almost a, a bureaucratic enterprise. And the sacraments become an enterprise of how does the church dole these things out. Now, I, this is a super simplified version, but I firmly believe that this is, that how I've described it is accurate, even if it is simplified. That's for mine. So, when going to RCIA in the 60s, I was given my prayer book. I was explained that you go to confession, you receive absolution, but it's not finished until you make the restitution. <clears throat> And you say five Hail Marys, and that will get you two days of indulgence. You say three Our Fathers, and that will get you um, a day of indulgence. So indulgences started becoming part of the confession and solution restoration process. And so that's the only way that you would know that you were forgiven is that you completed your restoration if you, if you and did. collected your indulgences of grace. Right. So, so you can see that at the absolute least, this confuses what does it mean to say that God looks at me in a certain way. That's the absolute least you can say about it, is that it is confusing. Um, at worst, you would say that, that, that this idea that, that grace is a substance or a thing that the church then doles out kind of creates the separation between God and the church and turns, and turns the church into a, uh, I would call it a bureaucratic institution that, that has its kind of its own ends. And it almost... And, and maybe this is partly our kind of 21st century eyes, but it, it has a, a very sort of capitalistic sense to it that, that we have to do this. The reason that indulgences really became this big thing um, in Luther's day was because they were trying to build and pay for um, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And so there was a special indulgence set up, a full plenary indulgence set up that would allow that would allow it so that if you purchase this indulgence, then uh, then you were you or your loved one was now free. And it had and didn't have to have anything to do with faith. It didn't have to have anything to do with receiving God's gifts or anything. It simply was a piece of paper. Um, and Luther looked at that and said, that can't be right. That's kind of a super simplified version. But, but that, uh, and that was what was being preached by this Dominican uh, priest, a uh, Dominican friar named um, Texel. And, and that is kind of the, the beginning, is this debate over indulgences, which is really a debate about the nature of grace. What is... What is God's grace, and how does God look? Now I see both hands, Andy and then Jill. Well, the the church was got into basic marketing. They marketed grace. Sure. They said, okay, you all are maybe a little bit saved, but you can be more saved. Well, and 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 again, I think that the law is very effective in certain things, and. The law can be very effective at scaring people into doing things. Um, in kind of a, in catechism terms, we call that the first use of the law, um, the kind of coarse outburst of sin. But I would also call that a we can attempt or pretend to use the law as a way of manipulating people as well. 
well. And, and all of us have heard um, uh, sermons, not here, thankfully, I pray, that, um, that essentially are trying to manipulate people into doing something. You know, anytime you hear a, if, uh, you know, if only you give X, then God is going to do Y, frankly, that is kind of indulgence talk. And it doesn't matter if it's coming from a non-denominational preacher or not. That is, the, that is the most indulgent sort of language you're ever going to get because it's using the law to try to manipulate people into doing something, which is wrong. That's not the purpose of the law, and it's not our law to use as we see fit. It's God's law, which he does, which he gives, so that we can learn of our need to receive his grace. That's the purpose of the law. Now, there's another hand over here. Oh, Joe, thank you. I learned, I don't know if it was in high school, I went to Lutheran High School, that the, the word grace, if you take it apart and do God's riches at Christ's expense, sure. that that just that clears all this other junk up. Sure. Yeah, that, and that's kind of a, a com, I would say a common acronym uh, for grace that, that you'll get. I like I personally think that it is very helpful to teach and teach and teach and teach that grace is God's God's attitude toward us. That grace is how God looks at us. That God looks at us with kindness. Because so often, um, if your view of God is based on what's on, going on in your heart, or is based on something that's happening in the world, or somewhere else, your view of God is going to be skewed and weird, and is going to be probably wrong. And so, this is, this is why St. Paul says, but now, <laughs> but now this comes apart from the law, that this grace comes apart from the law, that God reveals his grace to us, that I can't, I can't discover this myself, that God has to reveal this to me. Joe. Well, the other thing about it, when you say God's riches at Christ's expense, it totally, totally takes me and you out of the picture. Out of the picture. That's and right. that's the important part. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so good about the Lutheran faith, is that we're not constantly trying to do something to earn our way. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So let's look at a couple of these kind of uh, very important uh, bits from the Lutheran confessions that talk about grace. First one from the Augsburg Confession. Furthermore, it is taught that we cannot obtain forgiveness of sin and righteousness be God before God through our merit, work, or satisfaction. But that we receive forgiveness of sin and become righteous before God out of grace, here's our word, for Christ's sake through faith. When we believe that Christ has suffered for us, and that for his sake our sin is forgiven, and righteousness and eternal life are given to us. For God will regard and reckon this faith as righteousness in his sight, as St. Paul says in Romans 3 and 5 and 4. So, in other, in other words, this is how God, this is how God looks at me, and because God looks at me in these ways, these things happen. Because God looks at me in kindness, God forgives my sins for Jesus' sake. God gives me faith. God does all of this good stuff. And that that is based entirely in God's action and not in mine. Now, the opposite of that would be saying that something has to happen in me in order for God's grace to get to me. So, you know, either I have to, I have to be trying really hard, and, and I would call that God as a, God as a, as a, um, you know, motorcycle salesman or something. Okay, I got God's going to kickstart the motorcycle, but once, but once, once God kickstarts it, now, now I got to make sure to put the gas in and keep it going. Well, that's nonsense. <laughs> that's just nonsense. But that is sometimes how we think about it, that this is some sort of uh, partnership, that if, if God does his part and I do my part, then everything's going to be okay. Well, my part is being dead. I can do it. <laughs> Great. Dead in the trespasses and sins. I can get that. Nail it. But, um, but as long as it's a quality, if it's a 
quality that I have to possess in order for God to love me, then I am toast. <laughs> because I will never get that entirely right or even mostly right. This has to come from outside of me. And that's really the heart of it. Next one. Therefore, the sacraments are actually baptism, the Lord's Supper, and absolution. The sacrament of repentance. For these rites have the command of God and the promise of grace, which is the essence of the New Testament. So this is, so this is kind of a, a side piece to this, is the way that Lutherans look at sacraments has, has everything to do with the way that Lutherans look at grace. If grace means God's favorable disposition to me, then the sacraments are what, are what show me or deliver to me that grace, that favorable disposition, that God forgives my sins for Christ's sake. So their purpose is, is to give me something from God. Their purpose is not for me to do something for God. That would be the opposite. And so you would get, if you think of baptism as an act of obedience that you do because God told you to, well now baptism has actually become something that you do, not something that Everybody with me? All right. Moving ahead 35 years or something. Accordingly, we believe each and confess that our righteousness before God consists in this, that God forgives us our sins by sheer grace, without any works, merit, or worthiness of our own, in the past, at present, or in the future, that he gives us and reckons to us the righteousness of Christ's obedience, and that because of this righteousness, we are accepted by God into grace and regarded as righteous. I like that. In the past, at present, or in the future. <laughs> that's, that's a really nice, uh, nice language there that, that gets at. We are accepted by God into grace and regarded as righteous. God, and we have this line, one of our communion hymns this morning. Oh, we have such great hymns this morning. <laughs> allowing you to just stop it. Wow. <laughs> but one of the one of the fantastic hymns we have is a community hymn by Storm Word, and it's got this great line from an art Franzman. Uh, Thy strong word bespeaks us righteous. <laughs> and, you know, we, ne we never get to use the word bespeaks <laughs> nearly as often as we should. But that, that, that's the word. Thy strong word bespeaks us righteous. God speaks, and it is so. God says you are forgiven, and it is so. God says you are righteous, and it is so. Not because I've got it all figured out in my heart, but because that is who God is, and that he is the one who gives us all good things. I mean, and that is just one of the hymns. We also, of course, have By Grace I Can Say It, and so we get all kinds of stanzas about grace in there, too, which is awesome. Okay. Now, flip the page. And this is just one kind of kind of example of, of, of what Rome was speaking. Rome was saying kind of in the opposite of this, okay? And so this takes a minute for us to kind of parse this out in our heads. The Council of Trent was this uh, council that began the year after Martin Luther died and lasted for about 20 years. So if you ever feel like we have long voter meetings, <laughs> sorry, church council. <laughs> um, so, uh, so this is from the Council of Trent. So this is from the, this is to this day still the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. If anyone says that men are justified either by the sole imputation of the justice of Christ or by the sole remission of sins. To the exclusion of the grace and the charity which is poured forth in their hearts by the Holy Spirit and is inherent in them. Or even that the grace whereby we are justified is only the favor of God. Let him be enough. And enough of them means condemned. So if anyone believes that we're justified by the imputation of the righteousness of Christ, that's what justice is, of righteousness, or by the forgiveness of sins, if any of us believe that this is how, how we are justified, then you are condemned. That's the Council of Trent. 
and that's what uh, and that's what uh, the Lutherans, both before and since the Council of Trent, will look at it and say, that is not what the scriptures teach. <laughs> it just isn't. For by grace are you saved through faith, it is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That's the Pastor, thank you for clarifying the, the two forms of grace, because that still was an issue with the JEDJ, Joint yes. Declaration yes. of Doctrine of Justification, and also the Council of Trent, because Rome did not back off either of those positions. Right. So if anyone signed on to that Joint Declaration without having the this right of, of grace or the Council of Trent rescinded, they bought into the Council of Trent. So in 1999, so 21 years ago, 1999, there was a big uh, joint declaration called the JEDJ. I mean, it's a church, so we've got to have full acronyms, right? Joint Declaration of the Doctrine of Justification. This is this big joint thing that said that the Lutherans and the Roman Catholics are all getting together. It's all beautiful. And everything's wonderful. Um, the problem was is that it it simply never defined grace, and so you could mean grace as God's favorable disposition toward you, or you could mean grace as this quality that resides in you somehow. Um, and either one was fine, and as long as we don't ask each other too carefully what we think, then we agree, <laughs> which is also kind of nonsense. But so this was a this is a big deal. So and this is why sometimes if you're talking to friends or neighbors or whomever, either Roman Catholic or Lutheran, um, didn't I thought that Rome and Lutherans made up 20 years ago? This is why. It's because of that document, which the ELCA has fully endorsed. And so and so that's kind of all a part of this that we have to kind of Think through it. What's at stake is the forgiveness of sins. This is not some weird, weird thing that only pastors care about. <laughs> it's not. This is the very heart of what it means to be a Christian. Catherine. This kind of circles back to the beginning of the Bible class of Mary's comment about her relatives talking about you. You can't say that and actually believe, say you believe in the Bible. Right. And getting to this, you can't say what the Council of Trent said or what this says and actually say you believe in the Bible. Right. But that coincides with the fact that the ELCA and the Roman Church has generally not necessarily said they believe in what the Bible says as we sure. do. Sure. And I think that that is important because sometimes. We have to recognize they're just being what they say they are. Yeah. And any suggestion that they would say otherwise is not well, realistic. A couple, and, and you are, of course, correct. <laughs> um, a, couple of, uh, a, a couple of things that I think are also really important for us to recognize when we're talking when we're talking with people of a different faith background than our own, okay? So this is not just to apply to this, but it applies to everyone. First of all, I'm going to guess that you don't have the formula of Concord of 1577 kind of right on the tip of your tongue. I'm just going to go out and let me guess that. And that's okay. You don't need to. <laughs> um, and, and you're not expected to. But, I, but we do continually teach what we believe and why we believe it, and kind of learning these things. But not everybody understands what the church actually teaches. I'm sure that if we were to do a survey of Holy Cross Lutheran Church, that not everybody would, would completely understand the doctrine of grace. Because not everybody does. And it's a continual sort of process. And the other is just because just because the official church teaches something does not mean that an individual member believes and teaches that themselves. And that's a part of what I think it really becomes difficult to kind of make sense of is 
um, is that we have this crazy idea that we all believe the same thing. And I believe that we do. And that we continually strive toward that. That we work toward unity around the scriptures. This is why we teach the small package. This is why we have confirmation coming up in half an hour or whatever. All of these things. But that is a continual process that happens. Um, and it does not happen easily or well. Now multiply that times a billion, and you have the Roman Catholic Church, where there are many, many people that they that they have the faintest idea of what the church teaches. And even if they do, they disagree with it. But they're still Catholic because they go to Mass. And that and the exact same thing, of course, could also be true for us as Lutherans. I see a couple of hands, but we're going to run out of time real quick. Heather and then Dad. Is there an elevator pitch for the doctrine of grace? Well, the elevator pitch is, is that grace means God looks at us with kindness. That's what grace is. God looks at us with kindness and love and mercy. That's what grace is. And we get that kind of orientation right, then a lot of other things fall into place. Very, very simple. That's just, just a, one observation. Just Luther didn't want to throw out the Roman Catholic Church. He wanted no. to reform it. He wanted it to come back to the truth. But he was trying to find the middle road. And they weren't interested because right. of the point of control because they wanted to control what faith is. Yeah. They didn't want to instruct, they wanted to control. And if we were to do a whole history of the Reformation, which would be a lot of fun, we should probably do that sometime. We could um, we could get into that more. Um, I want to finish with kind of the why does this matter today? Well, it matters today, of course, because grace matters. Because how I understand how God looks at me is at the heart of what it means to be Christian. It is also important, and maybe equally important, that we recognize as, as Lutherans that, that a day like Reformation Day is not Lutheran Pride Day. <laughs> this is not, this is not, I know, I can't say that. I did that quite intentionally. You can't say this term, that you can't, you know, that this is not sort of Lutheran Cultural Heritage Sunday or something, mm -hmm. but that this is a deeply theological thing and that this matters a great deal and that it is not that we're better than those stinking Roman Catholics. <laughs> that is not the point and is right. never the point. I can't say that too clear that this is, this is not a matter of being better than anyone simply receiving and rejoicing what God gives us in his word. And that that is at the heart of the whole thing. Um, and wow, what incredible gifts God continues to give to his church on earth. That, that we are able to receive and confess this faith, um, even, even masks and all, that God, that God gives us these, these gifts to confess and to speak and to share with one and all. So on that fine note, we're going to we're going to stop, and you will uh, pick up. A, I don't remember which one of you is picking picking up next week. Who's on? You're on best control. Okay. Do you have a preview for what you're doing next week? Yeah, we're we are. Uh, Pastor Meyer and I will be doing in the month of November. Second Timothy, by the grace of God. Okay. I will do uh, chapters one next, chapter one next week. Okay. And then eight, then two, the following week, and then Pastor Martin will do three. All right. Wonderful. Well, Second Timothy is a great book. You will enjoy that very much. With that, let's close with the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of